Today we're building a $1,000 gaming PC. And the goal is to build something that not only offers a great way to get into PC gaming, but will also be future ready and upgradable for years to come. Now, a huge shout out to AMD for providing all the parts that you see here today and also sponsoring today's video. Let's show you how to build it. The heart of every PC build is definitely the CPU. And today we are going to be using the AMD Ryzen 5 7600. It's great because it's fairly cheap at $220, provides amazing performance for the money, and it's not going to bottleneck your system if you decide to upgrade your graphics card at a later date. It also comes with the Ray's Stealth Cooler, so you don't need to buy one if you don't want to. This is everything you need, so let's install it into the motherboard. So this is the B650 Aorus Elite AX. This is an AM5 board, it costs $220, and it's DDR5, which means it supports the latest memory. Now you can actually pick up AM5 boards for as little as $150 now, but we went with this one just because it looks a bit more high-end. It's got some RGB along with Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth. Now one of the best parts about the AM5 platform is that AMD is known for keeping the same socket across several generations. So if in a couple of years you decide you want to upgrade your Ryzen CPU to the latest model, you're not going to have to worry about buying a new motherboard. It'll just be a straight swap. To install our CPU, let's go ahead and lift up the little a lever right here that's going to allow us to lift up the bracket and then expose the socket to put our CPU in. We can grab that right here, take that out. Now there's going to be an arrow right up here in the corner and that's where you're going to line up your CPU into the socket, which the arrow is right there. So you can just take this and put it in just like that. And then you'll put this down. And as soon as you pull this lever down, it's going to pop off the front cover. Just like that. Easy peasy. For memory, we're gonna be using the Corsair Vengeance 32 gigabyte DDR5 kit, which is plenty for any gaming system. Now you can pick this up for around $100. It looks quite nice in the black, not to mention it's very low profile, so it won't interfere with any coolers or fans. Just make sure to look out for AMD Expo optimized versions. It's listed on the packaging. You wanna show them how to install the RAM? Yeah, so to install our memory, we're gonna be unlatching these two slots right here. So you can see we've got four. We're gonna be unlatching number two and number four. And we're gonna take our memory, we're gonna look at the labeled side, the one with the barcode on, and we're gonna line it up and use both hands to press down and you'll hear it click and you'll see the latches engage. That's how you know it's in. Do our second one. And that's it, how easy was that? <laughs> All right, so what is next? I believe storage, right? Yes. For storage, you've got plenty of options. We're gonna be using a one terabyte NVMe M.2 drive from Crucial, which comes in at around $50, which is actually a really good price. And you've actually got three M.2 slots on this motherboard, so you can always add more later if you decide to do that. And it's also got PCIe 5.0 support for when those newer drives become a bit more mainstream. Now to install our NVMe, we need to take off the heatsink right here, which is uh, held in by a screw now, typically, there's usually two screws that you have to take off, but a lot of motherboards are now implementing the quick release for the M.2, which is really nice. Yeah, so to install this, we're going to take it, we're going to line up this little notch right here with the notch on the M.2 slot. Mm -hmm. We're going to kind of put it in at a slight angle like that. You see it slot in, and then you can lift up this quick release latch just by pressing on it, and then we'll gently push down on our M.2 and snap this into place. And then just throw the heat sink back off. Don't forget yes, to don't take forget off. don't forget to take off <laughs> this thing. <sighs> now, if you're trying to keep things as cheap as possible, you'll be totally fine using the stock Wraith cooler that comes with the CPU. It's low profile, it's sleek, and most importantly, it's quiet. However, if you're planning on overclocking or you just want something a bit more substantial that's maybe gonna cover you for future upgrades, something like this, which is from Cooler Master, it's the Hyper 212 Evo V2 will do quite nicely. Now what's also great about the air cooler is that it comes pre-installed with thermal paste on the back of it so you don't have to faff about putting that on your CPU because it's already done for you. So we're gonna take a screwdriver, we're gonna take out these four screws right here and then once those four screws are removed we're gonna take out these two little brackets right here and then finally we'll take our CPU cooler, we're gonna line up the screws with the screw holes, we'll set it down gently and you wanna tighten these down gently from corner to corner. So what I normally like to do is just tighten up one side and then go to the opposite corner, tighten that down a little bit, and then do the same with the other two. That is all tightened down nicely. And then you're left with the CPU fan cable. That's going to plug directly into this gray little outlet right here that says CPU fan, and there. 
All right, that is everything on our motherboard. I think we can install it into the case now. Yeah, we're doing pretty good so far. <laughs> For the case, we decided to go with the Deepcool CK560. Now, the best part about this case is the price. It is only $100, and it comes with four fans pre-installed, three of which are addressable RGB, which means you won't have to buy any additional fans. This setup will work just fine. It's got plenty of airflow through the front panel, and despite being quite compact, it can fit the vast majority of components on the market. So again, if you're down the road and you want to install a bigger GPU, you shouldn't have any problems with this case. Now that we have the case on here, let's go ahead and lay it down so we can install our motherboard. Now I've already got our standoffs pre-installed, so we're going to take our motherboard, we're going to line it up with the standoffs right here. Once you've got those lined up, we're going to take our motherboard screws, there should be nine in total, and we'll get this tightened down. So that's our motherboard all installed. Now we're going to go ahead and install all the front I.O. cables and the fan cables into the motherboard. So the first thing we'll do is take off the side panel because that's going to give us access to some of the cables that are tucked around the back. Now one of the great things about this particular case is that it comes with a built-in RGB hub for the three front fans. So basically, you just press this little LED button on the top and it cycles through the colors. Now, they've actually gone to the trouble of hooking everything up already, so all the fans are daisy-chained together, at least the three front ones. All you need to do is to take this one connector and feed it through to the front of the case. Now, I'm gonna go through the bottom because there's actually a fan connector at the bottom of the motherboard. So I'll feed that through there. Now it's going to be labeled System Fan 3, it's this one right here, and all we're going to do is just take the fan cable and plug it in. Now you probably notice that the fan header actually has four pins, and the connector that we just plugged into it is only three, that's okay. This cable that you see right here is from the rear fan, so you'll see here we have a few different fan headers. This one is labeled System Fan 1, so we're going to take this cable and plug it into this header, just like that. And then if we lift the case back up, this bunch of cables right here coming from the front of the case, this is the front I.O. So it's responsible for things like your USB ports and your power button and your audio jacks. We're going to take this big one first of all, this is the USB 3 connector, and we're going to put it through this little cable grommet on the side of the case and pull it through. We're going to do the same with this one, this is the USB-C connector. This connector, the one that says HD audio on it, we're going to take this one and feed it through to the bottom of the case. And then these last two tiny ones right here are gonna be going also through the bottom of the case, but more so towards here. Once you've fed those all through, we'll lean the case down. USB 3 connector is gonna go into this connector right here. USB-C is gonna go into this one. Our audio connector is gonna be going in this one in the bottom left. And just make sure that you get it the right way around, because you can see here it has one of the holes blocked off, so you should just be able to match it up. All that's left is the hard drive LED and the power switch. Now the important one out of these two is the power switch because without this being plugged in, your system's not gonna boot. So if you take this power switch and you flip it around to the side that doesn't have the text on, you'll see there's a little triangle. Now what we're gonna do is look at the front panel connector right here. And we're gonna count across on the top row to the third and the fourth pin. We're gonna take the triangle side of the switch and we're gonna pop that into place right there. The hard drive LED is kind of optional. I mean, it flashes when stuff is writing to the drive, but it's the same deal with this one. Turn it around, look at the positive side, and we're gonna line this up on the bottom row in pins number one and two. Now that is honestly like the hardest part of the build out of the way. I know people always worry about the small cables, but what I'd advise you to do once you've got everything plugged in is just to tidy things up a little bit. So you see we've got some excess cables here. So if you just lift, lift up the case, and feed them through. Yeah, what you're aiming to do is basically have as little cables as possible in the front side of the case. We want them all tucked back here. If I spin this round so you guys can see, it's looking pretty clean. Next, we're gonna install the power supply into the back of the case. For the power supply, we went with the FSP Hydro G Pro 750 watt. Now, 750 watt is technically quite overkill for this build. It doesn't draw anywhere near that much power with the CPU only having 65 watt TDP. But again, you don't want to have to buy another PSU if you want to upgrade your CPU or GPU in the future. This one is 80 plus gold. It's fully modular, which means you only have to plug in the cables you're actually going to use. And the best part is you can find it as cheap as $100. Now, it's quite a lot of cables included with this PSU. 
few, but with it being modular, we're not going to have to use all of them. So we're going to locate the motherboard cable, which is this big chunky one right here. We've got the CPU cables. They're actually labeled as well, which is handy. Now, you technically only need to use one of these, but the motherboard does have two connectors. And if you're doing stuff like overclocking, it's usually best to connect both of them. So we're going to be using two. And then the last two cables that we have here are the SATA cable. This is going to power the RGB fans in the back. And then we have the cable for the GPU. So we'll start with the motherboard cable. It's actually labeled PSU, so you know which side goes in the PSU. So I'll basically just plug that into there. We've got our two CPU cables. You'll notice as well, there's a split side and a non-split side. The non-split side wants to be the side that goes into the PSU. So that's these two ports right here. We've got our SATA cable. So this one can go into any of these on the left right here. And then we got the GPU cable, which is gonna go right here. And that is all good to go. Now, when you put this into the case, you're gonna to want to make sure that the fan is facing the bottom of the case. Slot this into place. And then we're just gonna take our power supply screws. There should be four in total, and we'll just get them screwed in the back. And that is the power supply installed. Now we just need to pull the cables through and plug them into the motherboard. So that is the GPU cable. So we're gonna want that to be close to the bottom. That one down through there. Then we got our motherboard cable, which is gonna go through up here on the top. Then this is going to be the CPU cable. So that's gonna go up at the top. There should be a second one that we need to grab which is right there as well. While we've still got access to the back of the case, we'll get the single SATA power connector plugged in. So you should see somewhere this cable that has like a yellow tag on it. This is gonna be powering our fans. So just take your SATA power connector and plug it in. And then these excess cables, you can zip tie those or you can just stuff them into the bottom of the case. Or if you wanted to do some cable management, this would be the perfect time to do that as well. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll lay the case down now so we can plug in all those cables to the motherboard. So we got our motherboard cable first. We'll go ahead and plug that in. Then we got our two CPU cables up here at the top. Our first CPU connector is gonna go into this port right here, which is kind of closest to the CPU. You kind of have to hold them together. Do also make sure that each cable is pushed in properly because I've had that happen before where it's not plugged in properly and yeah. then you're wondering why your system's not booting. We have one CPU connector remaining. Now we actually only need to use one half of the split connector. So we'll get that plugged in. And then again, you can use this opportunity just to tidy up cables a little bit, pull any excess through the back. We pretty much got most of the cables shoved into the back, so we can go ahead and put the back panel on. Now, obviously, it's up to you how much cable management you do here. You're not gonna see it once the panel's on, but it does make it easier if everything is kind of cable tied and at least organized, because if you decide to add extra drives in the future, you know where all the cables are going. Next up, it's time to install the best part of the PC build, the GPU. So for the GPU, we went with the brand new AMD Radeon RX 7600. It comes in at $250, $20 cheaper in fact than its initial MSRP, which makes it a much more compelling option for 1080p gaming. It also fits very well into our $1,000 budget, although depending on what resolution you plan to game at, there are also some great deals to be had on AMD's previous gen, 6000 series GPUs if you can find them. Although of course with the 7600, you do get all the latest in terms of RDNA 3 architecture, including second gen ray trace and accelerator units along with AV1 encode decode which comes in clutch if you plan on streaming. To install your GPU is pretty simple all you need to do is make sure you take off of this PCIe cover right here that protects it and then you also need to remove your PCIe slots down by the uh, motherboard so that this will slot in. And it's going to be number two and three so we'll just loosen off the screws and then they just lift up like that. And then you need to unlock the latch right here and then you can go ahead and slot in your GPU. There we go. Those two screws that you just took out of the slot covers, we're gonna use those again, but this time we're gonna use them to secure the GPU. So they just go straight back into the holes you took them out of. And last, all we need to do is install the PCIe cable into the GPU. Yeah, it's usually labeled either PCIe or VGA in this case. 
just like that. And then once again, you can just do some tidying up with the cables. This is one of those like pigtailed cables. So I normally like to just tuck it behind. You could also zip tie it as well. Now that we've got it all assembled, let's get it plugged in and give it a quick test. Also something else to mention for beginners out there, make sure that you turn on this switch right here in the back or else your PC will not turn on. You wanna do the honors? I will turn it on. Ooh. Uh, this little button right here can change the color of the fans. I believe it has a bunch of different effects built into it as well, so you can just put it on whatever you like. Yeah, for a budget build with these RGB fans, that's really nice. I like how it's like quite compact as well. Yeah. So now that we've got it all assembled and we have verified that it turns on, we need to install Windows. Now I'm gonna put a link in the top right of the screen because I already made a step-by-step -step guide on how to do this. It will get you up and running in about 10 minutes. Also, once you've installed Windows, don't forget to hop into the BIOS and enable AMD Expo. This will make sure that your memory is running at its advertised speed. One final thing I just thought I should mention to all beginners out there, you wanna make sure that your cable to your monitor is plugged into these ports on the back of the GPU, not the ones in the motherboard. And now it's time for some uh, benchmarks. Now bear in mind, this is a 1080p system, so we are going to be testing in that resolution. Up first, Call of Duty Warzone. We're on the high preset here at native 1080p and seeing averages of around 107 FPS, which bear in mind can vary depending on the map. Next up, Fortnite. This was running on the medium preset with average FPS coming out to 146, which is right around that sweet spot for high refresh rate monitors. Overwatch 2 is up next. This was running on the ultra preset and native 1080p and our average frame rate here was 230, which made for a very smooth experience. Apex Legends is a similar story. On the high preset, we were constantly hitting upwards of 200 FPS with averages of around 223, maxing out most high refresh rate monitors. Forza Horizon 5 next, running at ultra settings. This one gave us an average of 127 FPS and really anything above 100 for these kind of games I find to be plenty smooth enough. And finally, Hogwarts Legacy. High settings here at native 1080p, no ray tracing, and we've seen averages of 123 FPS, which is quite impressive for what is a rather demanding title. And there we have it, a perfect 1080p system for those wanting to get into PC gaming for around $1,000. Performs great, and like I said earlier, AM5 offers plenty of longevity with a fantastic upgrade path for years to come. If you want to check out any of the parts from today's video, you can find them all linked down below in the description. Drop a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you're new. Once again, a big thanks to AMD for making this video possible. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Oh, 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 oh,